So, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn over to Matthew once again. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew 12. Last week, we focused on those verses 15 through 21, if you remember, and and, and, and Matthew's defense of Jesus' ministry from the Old Testament, from the, the servant passage of Isaiah chapter 42. That was, uh, and, 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 he, and we have the longest quote from the Old Testament in Matthew's gospel uh, right here in verses 18 through 21. So we're picking up in verse 22 today. So again, Matthew chapter 12, uh, beginning at verse 22. Matthew tells us, Then a demon-possessed man, a demonized man, literally, within the original language. So not possessions per se, but, but demonized. He was demonized. A demonized man who was blind and mute, couldn't speak, was brought to Jesus. And Jesus healed him. And presumably he cast the demon out, of course. So that the mute man spoke and saw All the crowds were amazed, and they were saying, this cannot be the son of David, can can he? But when the Pharisees heard this, they said, this man casts out demons only by Beelzebul, the ruler of the demons. And knowing their thoughts, interesting, isn't it? Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, And any city or house divided against itself will not stand. Like our government right now. (laughs) If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I, by Beelzebul, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? And for this reason, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man, and then he will plunder his house? He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, that's referring to Jesus himself, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him either in this age or in the age to come. Pretty serious statements that Jesus makes there at the very end. I, I kind of just want to start where kind of Keith had taken us at the start, just a consideration of God's forgiveness. Have you ever experienced a nagging doubt or a nagging question as far as God forgiving your sin? Uh, maybe it, it's been a, a skeleton back in your back closet that just comes out and hits you over the head, or... Or maybe it's uh, some habitual sin that you have committed over and over again and, and, and you fear to yourself that you've made one too many trips to the well of God's forgiveness. Whatever it is, have you ever had doubts regarding God's forgiveness, complete forgiveness of you? John Newton, you remember John, don't you? John wrote Amazing Grace, most popular hymn of all time. John Newton recounts how that for about a month in his own experience, uh, well, no, not a month, it was the better part of a year, when a sense of, of assurance of, of God's forgiveness was withheld from him. Uh, similarly, John Bunyan, you remember John, the author of Pilgrim's Progress, the Puritan, uh, Bunyan tells us within his book, entitled Grace Abounding to the Chief of Sinners, he says, for about the space of a month, about a month, that's why I got him crossed up there, a very great, a very great storm came down upon me, which handled me 20 times worse than all that I had met with before. It came stealing upon me now by one piece and then by another. First, all my comfort, 
was taken from me. That is his assurance of God's forgiveness. Then darkness seized upon me, after which whole floods of blasphemies, both against God, Christ, and the scriptures, were poured upon my spirit to my great confusion and astonishment. I mean, can you imagine that kind of turmoil? He'd lost a sense of God's assurance of of forgiving all of his sin. Have you ever experienced anything like that? Of course, when we, uh, we, when we consider such as experiences of, of Newton and, and Bunyan, when we compare that with what the Bible puts forward as the, the forgiving grace of God, his grace is abounding. It's, his grace is like an ocean of mercy. Keith referred to how God announced himself to Moses, the, those statements from Exodus chapter 34 where the Lord said this, the Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. And David said this in Psalm 86. He declared, For you, Lord, are good and ready to forgive and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. To all. And you remember in 1 Timothy chapter 1, when Paul thought about God's grace toward him, it just astounded him that God forgave him. He said this, verse 15, It's a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all, or chief, as some versions say. Think about that. Of all the sinners that Jesus came to save, Paul viewed himself as the worst. And and, and if we think that he had only his past life in mind before he was converted to Christ, well, wrong, because he says, among whom I am foremost of all. He uses the present tense. Knowing his own heart, as only Paul could know his heart, he couldn't imagine a worse sinner than himself as far as God forgiving him. And his point is, if Jesus forgives someone like me, he can forgive someone like you. Right? Again, as I said, when we think about God's forgiveness, it's like a a vast, boundless ocean that can swallow the sin of a a hardened 80-year-old man as easily and fully as it can a 7-year-old boy or girl, completely. His forgiveness is no respecter of sin. It really isn't. He forgives adultery, thievery, murder, as easily and completely as lust and anger and envy. And we always have what is referred to as the Christian bar of soap. You remember 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, that if we, what? Confess our sins... He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of all of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So if you've ever doubted or wondered if if the Lord could forgive someone like you and me, the witness of Scripture is yes, yes, he can. But, or however, as we come to our verses today within this passage, Jesus seems to throw a wrench into our thinking when he says this, verses 31 and 32. Therefore I say to you, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit, that is the Holy Spirit, shall not be forgiven either in this age or in the age to come. That kind of thing makes your blood run cold, doesn't it? And we wonder, I mean, what did Jesus mean by that? And we think, I don't want to ever commit such a sin as that, if that's the case. Now, some people have thought that the, the sin that Jesus has in mind was a sin of murder. But the Apostle Paul was a murderer in that he had uh, Christians put to death. Uh, some people think, well, it, it, it's adultery. Well, David was an adulterer. And he was a murderer. And yet God's forgiveness was toward David. And some people, maybe you've heard the view put forth before that, well, it's, it's committing suicide. 
That's what the, the unforgivable sin is. It's committing suicide. But there's no warrant in Scripture to make that connection at all. No warrant. I'll never forget the time back when I was in Carson City, had this uh, fellow that was going to our church. Craig was his name. And, and, and he thought that he had committed the unforgivable sin. He really did. And, and, and I, could, I could tell as, as, as clear as day that is, he hadn't. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been fearful that he had committed the unforgiv- uh, unforgivable sin. And so I met with him this one afternoon for about a couple hours, and I could not dissuade him from his conviction. He was miserable, thinking that God's forgiveness could not be toward him. And so we're left with a question, though. Just what is the unforgivable sin that Jesus is referring to here, right? And that's what we come to today. Now, before we attempt to clarify what Jesus meant here, again, look at the setting for this, this whole situation here. In verse 22, once again, we see Jesus delivering a demonized man and healing him of all of his afflictions, right? He was blind and mute, presumably caused by the, the evil spirit that was plaguing him. Now, just imagine that poor man's misery. I mean, for 10, 20 30 more years. We don't know how long it was. But to, to not have been able to speak a word or not to have been able to see a beautiful sunset because he was blind. Uh, we, you and I take speech and, and sight for granted, don't we? Every day we take our eyes for granted, our ears for granted, our ability to speak for granted. And that man was like a, a, someone trapped inside of his own body. And worse than that, he, was, he had the, the terrorizing presence of a demon who was plaguing him inside. But in an instant, Jesus cast, presumably cast that demon out when it says that he healed him. He cast the demon out, and the man spoke, and he saw. Just astounding. I mean, what a vivid illustration right here in the connection of, of, of the servant of God. Jesus was a servant of God. You look back at verse 18, the merciful servant who would not break off a battered reed nor put out a smoldering wick. And that man, was, his life was like a smoldering wick. It was, it was smoking. He was ready to go out. He was like a, a bruised reed, ready to be broken off. And, and Jesus did not break him, but rather delivered him. Didn't put out his light but he breathed light back into the man, right? Just an incredible display of grace toward that guy. But as, as, as incredible as the miracle was, that's not the main thing that Matthew wants us to see, to see here. What Matthew is highlighting for you and my attention is the hard-hearted rejection of the Pharisees toward Jesus and the way that they spoke of Jesus and, and the result of their hard-hearted uh, disposition toward Jesus. And a- again, as, as we've seen in the last several chapters within Matthew's gospel, the tension between Jesus and the religious establishment was on the increase. It was growing all the more. And, uh, and, 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 and when the crowd, when the crowd, we look, at, look over at verse 23, the crowd was amazed at this work, and they were saying, this man cannot be the son of David, can he? That was not a question of cynicism. The way that the, the, the question is phrased in the original language, they were actually expressing openness. This seems like it could be, he could be the Messiah. That's what they were saying. And, and when the Pharisees heard that, when, they, when they, they witnessed the crowd begin to express openness to Jesus, they struck like rattlesnakes. They could not abide by that. And it was, they could not deny that Jesus had power. They envied Jesus. But Jesus contradicted their system and was a threat to their power, right? He was. And there was no way, in their opinion, that they could afford to let the, the people be swayed by this one who they, they considered to be an imposter. That's what was going on. And so you can picture them kind of going around the fringe of the crowd, just kind of whispering in people's ears, this man does not do what he does by the power of God, but he does so by the power of Beelzebul. 
Right? That's what was going on. That raises a question. Who was Beelzebul? Who was Beelzebul? Well, originally, you think back in biblical history, clear back in 2 Kings chapter 1, verse 2, it refers to the pagan Philistine god of Baalzebul, which was their god at the town of Ekron, which was in Philistine territory, about 30, 40 some miles away from the Gaza Strip today. That's where Ekron was at. And so Baalzebul was their pagan god. And the name Baalzebul meant Lord of the heavens, Lord of the heights. So it was, a, it was kind of an honorary title, actually, for their pagan god. But the, but the Jews... The Jews took that name and they changed it slightly from Baalzebul to Beelzebul, which meant the Lord of dung or the Lord of excrement. They also changed it to Baalzebub, which meant Lord of the flies. So you see what was going on there, what the Jews were doing. They, 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 they took what was the pagan name and they slightly changed it to become a very slamming, kind of a derogatory kind of a name. Uh, spiritual trash talk, if you will. That's what was going on there. And, uh, but over time, the name Beelzebul came to be referred, of, uh, to referred to the demonic realm, particularly of the ruler of the demons, that is Satan himself. So it became a substitute name for Satan. And that's what, the, that's what the Pharisees were saying on that day, is this man doesn't do these things by the power of God, but he does these things by the power of Satan. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? John MacArthur put it so well when he said this. MacArthur said, their use of that derogatory name couched their blasphemy in the vilest possible manner. They called the highest and most holy one the lowest and most evil. They called the one who, had, who was pure good, pure evil. They called, the, they, they called God the devil. Perfect holiness, wickedness. Truth incarnate, a liar, and branded the Son of God a servant of Satan. Can you imagine that? Of course, their accusation was absolutely ridiculous. It was an illustration, of course, of the blackness of the human heart, apart from the grace of God. And isn't it true? Apart from God's grace working in a person's heart to receive Jesus, the natural person, it's not that they just can't see the truth. They don't want to see the truth. They're blind. But the Pharisees' rejection of, of the light that they were exposed to was just terrible. It was terrible. Now, as we look at verses 25 through 30, how did Jesus respond to this? How did he respond to this charge? And you can see he responded along three lines. First of all, look at verses 25 and 26, where basically Jesus tells them that their false charge was completely illogical. It was irrational. It didn't make sense. Any kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and any city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? It doesn't make sense. It's illogical. Now, we all, we've heard the statement before that, a, that a, trap, a trapped animal will do what in order to free itself? Well, it'll chew off its own leg in order to free itself. And these, these Pharisees were like a, a trapped animal. Uh, they, they would do anything. They would commit any kind of illogic, any kind of irrationality to, to put Jesus down. But Jesus says their, their, their charge is irrational. I mean, the Bible, the Bible tells us, right, that, that Satan is evil, but it doesn't tell us that he's stupid. Satan is not stupid. He's a brilliant, he's a brilliant master of deception and lies. Now, and, and Jesus says, you know, a kingdom divided against itself, Satan, if Satan is going to cast Satan out, if demons are going to cast demons out, his kingdom is going to implode. 
And we saw the, this very thing happen clear back in, in 2003. You remember when our, when our coalition forces were going into Iraq to invade Iraq? Do you remember how that when they were going in, our, our intelligence picked up all kinds of communication going on within Iraq where one person was telling their forces to do this thing, another one was doing, telling them to do this thing, and they were at odds with each other, and, and their kingdom, Iraq, fell. As, as, as our forces took over there. And the same thing here. As, as twisted and void of love for the truth that Satan is, he still has a kingdom that he wants to hold on to. He has a kingdom that he wants to hold on to. And as 1 John 3, 8 says, says the Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. And Satan's not going to just roll over. That's Jesus' point. It's completely illogical, you know, for the Pharisees to make that charge. Secondly, look at verse 27. Not only was it illogical, but Jesus accuses the Pharisees of being inconsistent. Verse 27, if I by Beelzebul cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. Now, what he means by your sons, of course, is your followers, the Pharisees' followers. And um, Jesus assumes, he, he assumes right there that there were actually uh, members of the Pharisaic party that actually were exorcists. They, they, they would go around and they would cast out demons. They would do that. Turn over to Luke uh, chapter 19, uh, not Luke, but book of Acts chapter 19, just for a second. In the book of Acts chapter 19, we find what is to me, it's kind of a humor, humorous situation. Acts 19, and this takes place when Paul was at Ephesus. He's on the missionary trail. Again, Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 16. Notice this. Well, back up to verse 11. God was performing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul so that handkerchiefs or aprons were being carried from his body to the sick and they were being healed, and evil spirits were coming out. Look at verse 13. But also, here it is, but also some of the Jewish exorcists who went from place to place attempted to name over those who had the evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. <laughs> Seven sons of one Sceva, a Jewish high priest, were doing this. And the evil spirit answered and said to them, I recognize Jesus, and I know about Paul, but who are you? Wouldn't that have caused just a hair on the back of your neck to go up? Oh, man. And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. That's funny. <laughs> That's funny. But point being, that it was that there were these Jewish exorcists, there were members of the Pharisaic party that would go around, and presumably, they did cast out demons on occasions. And that's Jesus' point. Jesus' point is you're completely in inconsistent. If you say that they do what they do by the power of God, and yet you're saying of me, and I'm doing this categorically more powerful, that I do it by the p power of Satan... You're completely inconsistent. That's his point. And of course, the Pharisees would never admit that their followers did what they did by the power of Satan. But they would say that of Jesus. Even though Jesus, Jesus' exorcisms were categorically superior. Jesus would cast out demons by just a word. Go. Get out of here. Right? But such was the case of the Pharisees that they didn't want the, the facts of the situation to, uh, to blind them. And thirdly, you see in verses 28 through 30, coming back to Matthew chapter 12, that Jesus argues for the inescapable conclusion regarding his ministry and identity. You see it right there. Pick it up in verse 28. Jesus says, But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. In Luke's parallel account, 
rather than Jesus saying, but if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, Luke has him saying, by the finger of God. And I think he probably said both. If I cast out, finger, I, I cast out demons by the finger of God, the Spirit of God, the kingdom of God has come upon you. I don't know about you. When I hear Jesus say that he casts out demons by the finger of God, I can't help thinking, he's not saying that he casts them out. He doesn't need the arm of God. He doesn't need the hand of God. He doesn't need the finger of God. Like you do when, you, when you're reading a book and a fly comes down and lands on the top. What do you do? And, and Jesus could do that with demons. Get out of here by the power of God's spirit. Shoot fly. Go. But there was an Old Testament background that should have come to mind for the Pharisees when they heard Jesus say this, when they referred to the finger of God, the spirit of God. And you remember the scene in, in, in Exodus chapter 8. You remember when after God had brought various plagues against Egypt and, and, and the magicians of Pharaoh ha, had replicated those different works on their own, such as turning water into blood and, and the frogs, they actually, they actually replicated some of those things on a, on a smaller scale, of course. Um, but then Moses was directed by God and, 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 and Moses, what? He uh, struck the dust with his staff and a plague of gnats formed. Remember that? Gnats. Like flying, flying flies, but flying ants would bite people and so forth. And when they did that, and, and, the, and Pharaoh's magicians couldn't replicate it, they cried out, this is the finger of God. Okay? That's what they did. Right there in verse 19 of Exodus chapter 8. So when the Pharisees heard Jesus say, what he did, that, that, that he cast out demons by the finger of God, by the spirit of God, they should have had come to mind for them the difference between spiritual counterfeits of the demonic and the true works of God, which God had done through Moses and which God did, of course, through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, that's, that's the kind of thing that's going on here. They should have, they should have been able to connect that. The kingdom of God had broken through and the king was on the scene. And next, notice how that Jesus gives them an, a, simple, a simple analogy of his own power in verse 29. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house? Picture yourself going into some big burly, strong, muscled guy's house, walking into his house and saying, hey, give me your big screen television and I want your power washer out in the, in the garage. And, and being that it's cool April nights here. And while you're at it, give me the keys to your 68 red cherry, red Chevy Camaro SS. He, he's not going to give you such things unless you can overpower him and take those things away from him, right? And that's Jesus' point here. That's Jesus' point. Satan is not going to give up what belongs to him unless someone who is more powerful, who is more awesome, is able to walk into his house and take it from him. And that's what Jesus did. That's what Jesus did. And so when the Pharisees attributed Jesus' power to exercise demons to Satan, it's hard to imagine them more sinfully and hard-heartedly calling good, evil, right, wrong, the power and person of God, the, the power and person of Satan. On the contrary, it was the accusing Pharisees, not Jesus, who were agents of Satan in this situation. And that's why Jesus could say, and why he did say in verse 30, and notice that, he says, He who is not with me is against me, and he who does not gather with me scatters. Pause and think about that just for a moment. How many times have you seen people say, or they seem to indicate, you know, they, might, they, they, they say, you know, I, 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 I'm really not a follower of Jesus. Uh, I, I'm not like you, but, but I'm not against him either, right? Say, I, I, I don't believe in the Bible as you believe in the Bible, but I'm not opposed to it either, right? How many times? 
It, it's as though we, we live amongst people who think to themselves that they can take or leave Jesus safely. No, thank you. No Jesus today. And, and think that they're still, still safe from the judgment of God. No, it's not true. As Jesus says, you're either for him or you're against him. There's no middle ground. There was no middle ground in that situation with the Pharisees as, as they were accusing Jesus of doing what he did by the power of Satan. Now here we come. Having worked through the setting of this passage, we can now attempt to define more closely, more accurately, what, what just is the unforgivable sin? What is the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit that we see here within this passage? Now, understanding blasphemy is simple enough. Blasphemy is the sin of defiant irreverence. It is the sin of speaking evil of holy God, putting God down. It's blasphemy. In the Old Testament, the penalty for blasphemy was death by stoning. Uh, and yet, prior to his coming to Christ, the Apostle Paul said that he himself had been a blasphemer. Right? He had been a blasphemer. But Paul had been forgiven. He had been forgiven. And here in this passage, here in our passage, Jesus distinguishes between blasphemy directed against him, the Son of Man, as opposed to blasphemy directed against the Holy Spirit. One was forgivable, blasphemy of him, and the other, the other was unforgivable, according to how he puts it here. What's the difference? What was the difference? Well, one important thing to understand and keep in mind is that during Jesus' earthly ministry, of course, there was much about Jesus that wasn't readily apparent. It wasn't clear. Jesus' deity was covered over by his humanity. Jesus became hungry. Jesus became weak. Jesus died upon a cross. And so his identity, as far as being the God-man, wasn't readily apparent. And even a person like the Apostle Paul could miss recognizing Jesus as the Messiah and even speak evil of Jesus and yet be forgiven because what Paul did was done out of ignorance. And Paul said that much. He said that to, to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 13. He said this, Even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. You see it? You hear what he did? On the other hand, as we see in this context, there were times when Jesus did such astounding things that the only reasonable explanation for them was that he did them by the power of God, by the Spirit of God. There was no other reasonable explanation. There was no confusion. It was as plain as the nose at the end, end of one's face. It was that kind of cl clear. A person could be confused about a good many things, but when they saw Jesus cast out this demon, when they saw Jesus give sight to the blind, cause a par paralytic person to get up and walk, when they saw such things, they had to recognize it as the power of God at work. But when they did what the Pharisees did here, it was a deliberate, hard-hearted rejection of what they indeed knew to be the truth. That's what it was. That's what they were guilty of. It, it's not that Jesus was saying that he was somehow less important than the Holy Spirit. It's just that regarding his person, there were things that were hidden, yet he did things purely by the power of God. And when they blatantly rejected that evidence and labeled it the work of Satan, they placed themselves in an unforgivable state. In other words, they put themselves beyond the reach of God's grace. God himself had no further evidence to give them than what they had been exposed to through our Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that's, that's what blaspheming the Holy Spirit was at that time. Again, let me be clear on this. It was the deliberate 
purposeful, hard-hearted rejection of the irrefutable evidence of God that was presented to them. That's what it was. Now we're left with a question today. Can someone today commit the sin or, or the sin of unforgivable sin? Can they do that today? Now some say that because we live in a day when such Holy Spirit empowered miraculous signs aren't being done in such a clear irrefutable way, it's not possible to commit the unforgivable sin today as it was then. Some people say that. Some say the unforgivable sin was something a person could only commit during the days of Jesus' earthly ministry. You've probably heard that position before. But I would suggest otherwise. I would suggest that there is somewhat of a parallel between what we see here and what we see, we hear the Apostle Paul, for instance, give us in Romans chapter 1. Turn over there. Romans chapter 1. You remember that in Romans chapter 1, yes, Paul is he's talking about the glorious gospel. Verse 16, in which... the in the gospel, he's not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. It's good news. Power to salvation. But why does anyone need to be saved? And then he goes on to, to, to build a case for, uh, for the wrath of God. Verse 18 is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Okay, so he begins to build a case about the lostness of people. And between verse 18 and verse 32, three times Paul talks about, he makes the point that in view of people's rejection of the truth, in view of people's rejection of what they know to be true of God, God gave them over. Right? You see it three times in those verses. God gave them over. There, there, there is a, there's a, a judicial kind of wrath that comes upon people as a result of the rejection of what they know to be true. And the last of those giving overs is so serious. Look at verse 28. And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. And then he lists this list of vices there. You see it right there. And then he gets to verse 32, and then he says this, And although they know the ordinance of God, they know the truth of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. What is this saying? It's saying that when people have so rejected the truth, the, the witness of God that comes to us through his creation and through the word of God, when they reject what they know to be true and they, get, they descend to such a level, they're given over by God to this depraved mind. And what happens is they end up calling good evil and they call evil good, and they've lost any kind of ability to discern between truth and error, goodness and evil, and so forth. I think this is very much along the lines of the unforgivable sin. And let me just clarify, it's, it's not, in my opinion, it's not a one and done kind of a thing. It's not a, a, a you, you just commit some sin and it's the unforgivable sin. No, it's a, it's a, a mindset. It's a, it's a life. Listen to how Leon Morris put it. And I think that this is put as well as anyone could put it. Leon Morris in his commentary on Matthew said this. He said, this is talking about the set of the life. Not any one isolated saying. When a person takes up a position like that of the Pharisees, when, not by way of misunderstanding, but through hostility to what is good, that person calls evil, and on the other hand, makes evil his good. 
He calls good evil and on the other hand makes evil is good. Then that person has put himself in a state that prevents forgiveness. It's not that God refuses to forgive. It's that the, the person who sees good as evil and evil as good is quite unable to repent and thus come humbly to God for forgiveness. So can someone commit the unforgivable sin today? I, I conclude that they can. And again, I would re repeat, it's not a momentary thing. It's not like an outbreak of anger. It's not an, like an outbreak of lust and so forth. But it is. Let me, I, I want to read my notes here. It is the continued, deliberate, decided, knowing rejection of the truth. There's no excuse of ignorance to be hid behind. No. What such a person does is turn away from what he or she knows to be true. And that's frightening. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 and 27 put it this way. Again, Hebrews 10, 26 and 27. It says, for if we go on sinning willfully, that is habitually, you're just given over to it. If we go on sinning willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a terrifying expectation of judgment. Whew. What a sobering responsibility, isn't it? It's a sobering responsibility to respond to the light that God gives to a person. It's better to be lost in blind ignorance than to know the truth and yet turn away from it. It really is. At least for the person who is lost in ignorance, sinful ignorance, repentance is still a viable possibility. But for the person who willingly, habitually, continues to do evil and call it good, and calls good evil. You see it. They're, they're, they close the door upon the possibility of forgiveness if that continues to be the case. He or she is in an unforgivable state. May we never be guilty of such a thing. I mean, none of us, ever. And should anyone be like my friend back in Carson City who was fearful that he had committed the unforgivable sin, uh, I would be quick to say if someone is, is you know, fearful of that, oh, no, I don't want to commit that. I, I, I want the grace of God. I, I want God's forgiveness toward me. If that's the case, I would be quick to say God very much is able to forgive give your sin. Go to him. Go to him today. A person who is guilty of the unforgivable, unforgivable sin is like the Pharisees in our passage. The Pharisees would never admit, these guys at least, would not admit that they were in need of God's forgiving race, grace. They had it all figured out. Jesus was evil. And they labeled the, the power that Jesus did what he, by which he did as of the devil. Again, they removed themselves from the possibility of forgiveness. It wasn't God's fault. It was their fault. And if that's, if that's any, of, any of us, if, if, you, if you are fearful that you have committed the unforgivable sin, if anyone who is listening or watching this broadcast on the Internet, you're, you're fearful that you've committed the unforgivable sin and you don't want to commit it, you want God's grace, by definition, God's grace can be towards you, is towards you in Christ. Lastly, I would say today that if, if you're not sure where you stand with God, boys back in the back, I would say if you were to die today, you were to draw your last breath today, your heart was to take its last beat today, and you were to die, would you know where you're going to go? Would you know where you're going to go? Are you going to go to heaven? Are you going to be in, in God's very presence forever and ever? Or are you going to descend into hell where you will experience eternal torment forever and ever? Which way are you going to go if you were to die today? For anyone who does not know where your eternal 
destiny is situated. We would implore you, don't walk to Jesus. Run to Jesus. Run to Jesus. Run to him today. Cast yourself before him. Ask him to forgive all of your sin. May we all take these words seriously. And may God give us grace to impart these thoughts to others when we see them in their different life situations. Let's go ahead and stand. Keep that chorus in your mind. We're going to sing it after I say amen. Just a closer walk with you. We're just going to sing the chorus, not the the whole song. I think you can do that. We can do that together. Oh, Lord God, I know that there are some of us here who, there are those in our life that we, we are fearful that they are in this very place of rejecting the truth hard-heartedly calling good evil and calling evil good and knowing it full well. Our hearts fear for them. We would pray even now that your mercy would be toward them, that you would turn their perspective away from where it's at. For all of us here in this room, Lord, may we take you serious. May we fear you. May we revere you. You're not someone to be trifled with. Oh, may we we fall before you and acknowledge our needs that anyone who puts their trust in you will not be disappointed. Lord, may you work in our lives, we pray. In Jesus. Amen.